What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Endoscope Podcast. My name is Joshua M. Hicks, host and senior writer for War Media. And I have a very special guest with us. Met him at the, t- the, the basketball tournament, TBT, last year. Great guy. He's a play-by-play broadcaster for Big Ten Network, NBC Sports, ESPN, and Stadium. I want to introduce you guys, Chris Bosters. Chris, how you doing, man? What's up, man? Good to be with you, Joshua. I'm actually going to take a page out of your book on Twitter and, and just say that I'm blessed to be alive and well and, and happy to be <laughs> on your podcast talking some hoops. Man, I appreciate that. We're <laughs> glad to have you on the podcast for sure, man. Um, obviously, we got a lot of TBT stuff that happened because they just had the championship. But where are you at right now? I'm just at the crib, man. Um, I'm in a little neighborhood of Chicago called East Village. It's kind of tucked in between Wicker Park and West Town. So uh, spent about a week doing TBT related stuff. And now I'm just back in Chicago uh, chilling. Okay. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. Uh, glad you're, you were safe and yes. you know, taking, taking all the precautions necessary as you're still doing your job, man. Um, it's definitely a big thing that us as media members have to deal with. And Speaking of media and working, uh, you were covering the TBT this past uh, week, I want to say, in, in, in Indianapolis, I want to say. The tournament is actually in Columbus, but um, for media purposes, I, I believe you mentioned uh, prior in our previous conversation that it's in Indianapolis. Talk about what that was like. Yeah, so, you know, everybody is obviously trying to make sports media as safe as possible these days, and so... For the basketball tournament itself, the competition, the games, and for that matter, the players and tournament personnel were all in Columbus playing out a nationwide arena. And the broadcast team, however, everybody with the exception of Jen Hale, who was our sideline reporter for the tournament, and she's actually also the the courtside reporter for the New Orleans Pelicans. But while she was in Columbus, everyone else was at a remote studio in Indianapolis. And there was a a third party production company that TBT hired out to package these games and their studios were in Indianapolis. So it was a testament to technology really that all of this was able to be done remotely. And I think for the better part of all the games that we showed, the audience really wouldn't have known that we were in Indianapolis and, and the games were in Columbus. So Everything went pretty smoothly, but um, yeah, we were we were not actually on site watching the games courtside. We were in a studio watching the games off of two big television monitors that they had uh, stationed on these desks that we were working out of and broadcasting out of. So it was a really cool setup. Who did you do any of this broadcasting? Uh, who's your broadcasting team? So for me personally. I, I, was, uh, I spent the first weekend of games broadcasting with Dan Dockich, who's uh, an ESPN radio personality in Indianapolis, and college basketball fans in particular are probably familiar with him because he does a lot of Big Ten college hoops, and he does a lot of high-profile games on ESPN. And then I was also paired with Seth Greenberg, who's one of the anchors or one of the hosts for – ESPN college game day during the basketball season as well. So he's at the desk with Jay Williams and Jay Billis and uh, Reese Davis, whenever those guys do the game of the week at Duke or Kansas or whatever the case may be. So it was cool to have the chance to work with some of the big time ESPN media personalities that they, uh, you know, provide the tournament to use. And, and guys like Dan and Seth Greenberg, as well as Fran Fraschilla, do a great job of promoting the tournament on social media and things like that. So it was really cool to get the chance to work with them. Now, you mentioned that the media bubble itself was separate from what the players experienced in Columbus. Now, obviously, from a player's perspective, I'm pretty sure they was quarantined everything. They made sure everything was quarantined. They tested the players consistently, even before and probably after games and practices. Talk about the procedures you guys had to take from a quarantine perspective since you guys were at a different location. Well, it was not quite as rigid as the protocol that players and personnel on site had to go to, had to go through. I was never tested for COVID-19 at any point, but 
every time I entered the building where we broadcast games, I had to get my temperature taken. And I was aware going in that if I clocked in, if you will, with a temperature over 100.4, I would have to turn around and, and go home and, and quarantine and essentially be done with the broadcast. So fortunately, I, I never even peaked over 100, so I never had to worry about that. But in addition to getting our temperature taken, upon entering the building, we had to be masked up at all times unless we were on the air. And there were also some really, I think, enhanced social distancing protocols that were put into place. They essentially broke the building down into two halves. And one half was for broadcasters, people who were on air, on camera. And then the other half was for people who were on the production or the technical team behind the scenes. So in my portion of the building, there were never more than five people in a fairly large area. And so it was really easy to social distance in addition to the fact that we were wearing masks. And another cool thing that they had us do as well is, you know, broadcasters are wearing headsets with microphones to broadcast the games. And I had my very own headset that no one else used, again, for sanitation purposes. So I basically plugged my headset in whenever I was about to call a game. And then when I was done for the night, I would unplug, put my headset in a Ziploc bag, and then it was sanitized overnight. So it was clean to use when I got back to the studio the next day. So there were lots of protocol in place. And honestly, it really wasn't that big of an impediment. I mean, things moved pretty smoothly and everyone was on the same page and it wasn't like it was a huge hassle or a pain or anything like that. That's, that's, that's interesting because if you talk about the NBA and other professional sports that have specific bubbles that they're working with, the media are being quarantined from the top down, just, just like the players. And for you guys not to experience that, but also still practice the protocols, it's really interesting. We're going to highlight some of that a little bit later, but transferring to the actual tournament itself this year uh, from a player's perspective. I didn't watch all of it, but I did watch some games, and it was very exciting. For sure, very exciting to see, especially with Marquette going back-to-back -back champions, going back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back, you know, championship rounds and actually winning it this year. Um, what made this year so special? Because we met, because obviously we met last year. We was on the floor when we, were, when we saw Marquette go against Ohio State in the championship game, and then obviously you were there this year with Marquette. So what, was the, what made this year so special and iconic compared to last year? There were so many storylines and so many angles that made the tournament really fun to cover. And I think first and foremost, and I know we have been talking about this already, but you've got the COVID-19 cloud that's hanging over everything, man. And so there were questions coming in about, hey, would we even be able to start the tournament on time? Would there be teams that – would there be so many teams that had positive tests that there would no longer be enough teams in the field? So fortunately – we cleared those hurdles early on in the process. And once it became clear that the bubble was working and positive tests had been contained and teams that did have positive tests were swapped out with teams that were sort of on standby, the level of play is what really took over and I think kind of became the main story going forward. So there were so many great individual performances. You mentioned the Marquette alumni team. Absolutely. The fact that they were so close to winning the championship last year, then to get back to that level this year and win it on an Elam ending three pointer by Travis Diener, who's a local legend and even more so now after hitting the shot to win the million bucks, that was a huge storyline. Another storyline that was fascinating to watch was Joe Johnson the seven-time NBA All-Star, former Atlanta Hawk, Brooklyn Net, among other teams, he decides that he wants the ball with Overseas Elite, the team that's won four TBT championships already. And he went on a great run and was named to the TBT All-Tournament team and had a 35-point game in, in Overseas Elite's second time on the floor and frankly looked like he could still hold his own on an NBA court, to be honest with you. So there was that level of excitement. And then you also had some of the new teams in the tournament field this year. Um, there was an Illinois alumni team that I think surprised a lot of teams. They actually took out 
the defending champion Carmen's crew from last year. They beat them this year as a, as a first time TVT participant. And you had recent Illini like Malcolm Hill and Andres Felice on the team. And then you also had some non Illinois players as well, like Mike Dom, who played at South Dakota state and actually became the seventh all time leading scorer in NCAA history. Just, racked up a ton of points in college and is now a, a successful professional overseas. So, and I, this is one thing that I talked about too, you know, before we came on, people were a little maybe nervous or hesitant that look, these guys haven't played in four months. Is the, is the level of basketball going to be any good? Oh, and by the way, there are no fans in the stands. So is there going to be kind of any kind of energy in the arena? And you found out pretty quickly that a, these guys clearly did a great job training and staying in shape through this pandemic because the level of play and the conditioning was excellent. And B, you still had a lot of energy and passion, intensity and enthusiasm that you could feel through the screen, even though there weren't any fans in the stands. I mean, these guys wanted to play, wanted to be there. And, and I think the audience really could sense that. Everybody listening right now, you're listening to Chris Foster's Man, Chris, was, was Marquette the team you originally wanted to pick to win? Yes, it was. I, I mean, and, and, like, it wasn't necessarily a sleeper pick. I mean, they're the four seed coming in. They had a first-round bye. So you're like, okay, you know, these guys, not only were they in the finals last year, but they were in the semifinals the year before that. So these guys have been around – they know what the tournament is about. And with all of the craziness going on with COVID-19, you, you thought a, a veteran team like that would be best equipped to handle the tournament this year specifically. But man, from the time they took the floor the first time this tournament, everyone knew that, okay, this is a team to watch. This is a team that has a really, really good chance of winning the championship this year. Their core three, their three best players, it, it was Darius Johnson Odom, who got a cup of coffee in the NBA with the Dallas Mavericks. It was Dwight Bikes, who was one of Marquette's best players all time. And looks like he could seriously fill out an NBA bench spot as well. And then you had Jamil Wilson. Those three players really anchored the Golden Eagles team this year. And the way that they were playing in sync – you could tell that they had played a lot of basketball together. Their chemistry was on point from the jump. And they became a team that, like, pretty early on in the process, I mean, you, you could tell, like, okay, even if they don't win the whole thing, they're going to get awfully close and, and make a pretty good run at this. What, what, what was a, a, a sleeper team maybe that might have surprised you throughout this tournament? You know, I think if you look at the championship game, Golden Eagles took on a sideline cancer team that was the 22nd seed out of 24. And I think they were absolutely the surprise team. I mean, they didn't have a first round bye, And so to make it through a really tough field, they had to play one more game than every other team in the final four. Uh, they were a team that, that I think really took a lot of people by surprise. And one thing that's cool about them, and, and this is something that can be said for TBT as a whole, you get these teams not only that represent college groups, college alumni teams like the Marquette team, but Sideline Cancer is a team that plays for a cause. So they, they were repping pancreatic cancer this year. And, you know, a lot of what they do is just generate awareness around a cause, in, the, in their case, pancreatic cancer. And had they won the $1 million jackpot, they would have donated some of their player shares to pancreatic research. So that – tugged at a lot of heartstrings, if you know what I mean. And there were a lot of people that sympathized with them and sort of got on their bandwagon once they started winning games in particular. But they were legit, man. I mean, they deserved to be in that championship game as much as any other team. They had a couple of really good college players, uh, former college players, I should say, Maurice Creek, who played at Indiana, uh, Remy Abel, who also played at Indiana and transferred to Xavier. And then their best player was probably – a guy by the name of Marcus Keen, who went to Central Michigan and averaged 30 points per game three seasons ago and led all of Division I college basketball in, in scoring three seasons ago. So they played really hard. They had some talent. And as, as, you know, as good as they were, as much as they deserved to be in the championship game, 
I think they surprised a lot of people by making the run that they did. Talk. Let's go in more in depth with the actual players itself, because the players you mentioned, like Joe Johnson, these are professional players that, even though they may not have survived in the NBA, they had some experience in the NBA. Or quite frankly, if you look at the rosters, they could potentially make a roster. I mean, even Joe Johnson, like you mentioned, he balled out in this tournament from what from the from the numbers that I've seen and from even the, one of the games that I saw. Like you said, he could hold down his his own in the NBA still if he, if, the, if he was given a chance. Talk about how TPT could potentially be another one of those miniature leagues like the Big Three, where NBA players or former NBA players that believe they can still play the game can participate in and even utilize that as a platform to get themselves back into the NBA. We were all over that this year, especially. And again, with nothing else going on in the basketball world or, or really for the better part of the sports world right now, I mean, we knew from people that we talked to in and around the tournament, hey, there are a lot of NBA scouts, a lot of NBA front office members, a lot of NBA personnel that are going to be watching this tournament as, a, as sort of a talent evaluation. And certainly the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic and the NBA is getting ready to reboot again, I think that made more eyeballs turned or tuned into TBT this year maybe than in a typical year. But I think even independent of that, this is a great – every year this tournament becomes more and more of a platform for players who play overseas or in the G League to showcase their talents in front of a national audience, play back in the United States in some cases for the first time in a while, and, and really land on the radar of some NBA teams that might be looking to fill out their bench for the upcoming season, might be looking to extend some invites to summer camp, Maybe, uh, you know, a guy, you, you, for instance, you see a guy like Darius Johnson Odom play really well in the tournament this year. And, and if you're an NBA scout, maybe you think, okay, uh, maybe this guy is a, is a candidate for a, for a two-way contract or even a 10-day contract once things get up and running again. So I think that, you know, for all of those reasons, this is an awesome venue. And maybe even, you know, not to compare – TBT to big three and, and say one's better than the other or anything like that. But for those of you who might not be familiar, TBT is, is five on five full court basketball. You know, it's not, you know, big three is half court and it's really just a completely different style of game, even strategically from five on five full court. So it's not three on three. I mean, this is the kind of basketball that they play in the NBA and you see a lot of guys that have had the chance to hone some skills overseas, still playing professionally at high levels, and, and they get better. I mean, they, they become more NBA eligible or have more potential to crack an NBA roster because they're overseas or playing in a pro league or playing in the G League, working on their skills at a very high level. So these aren't guys that are, you know, just – hoping and praying to crack an NBA roster again. These are guys that legitimately have a chance to get some looks from NBA scouts or at the very least play in some of the more prestigious overseas league, leagues, whether you're talking about Spain or France or Italy, Turkey, Greece. You know, there's some great overseas leagues as well that those guys are auditioning for also. And I think the TBT has a – has an extra edge compared to those other leagues just because of the fact that it's local. I mean, you, you have a lot of uh, players that are so used to traveling way overseas across different countries just to make some money, where in the TBT, you, ha you can increase your viewership, from, like you said, from a scouts perspective because everything is local. You may even have your family being able to watch. I mean, post obviously, pandemic was a little different, but you may have a, you know, more of a family attendance, more family viewership. And depending on your money, you can stay local, work on your skill set. I mean, when I talked to Dimitri McKamey last year, he, that's what he told me when he won a championship with Carmen's crew. He said this could be a league that could really hope to precede other professional leagues overseas just because of the fact that you can work on your game, win some money, and on top of that, stay local. Where, where, where really the family aspect for these players can be much more of a reality for their circumstances. That's a great point. And, and, and you're right. It, it does kind of tie together – a lot of those things, a chance to play in front of family or, or you know, in a, from a larger point of view, an American audience for the first time. And, and you see with those 
that with these college alumni teams, whether it be Ohio State or Illinois or Syracuse or Marquette or whatever the case may be, you know, you've got these fans say, like in the, in the case of Dimitri McCamey now, I know he went to Illinois and, and was playing on an Ohio State team, but just stick with me. I mean, you know, a, an Illinois fan might say, oh, Dimitri McCamey, I mean, I remember when he was first team all Big Ten 10 years ago. I, you know, I wonder what this dude's been up to. This is cool that I get the chance to see him play again. And so you get connections like that, that really, I think, have helped grow TBT's fan base. And as you also said, at, at the end of it, these guys are playing for something. I mean, they're playing for a million dollar prize. It was $2 million last year. And the reason why the pot went down this year was because TBT had to put more money into health and safety measures. But once this gets back up and running, I think, hopefully as soon as next year, I think you're going to see that pot grow and expand again. And so it's not just a feel-good story. Like these guys, as I was trying to say before, I mean, these guys aren't washed up. I mean, they're still really high-level basketball players chasing that money. And it really makes for a really fun tournament to watch in a lot of different ways. Everybody listening right now, you're listening to Play by Play broadcaster Chris Bosters, and that's Bosters with a V. So with that being said, <laughs> thank you, thank you, man. I appreciate you. I, it's it's like that gets messed up so much, man. Like people always think it sounds like an F, and and I understand why. But so thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem, man. No problem, man. <laughs> we all got to make sure we all get the notoriety around here. So I got to make sure you get the right credit. That being said, we're talking about the NBA, and the NBA is currently in a bubble situation similar to what TBT had to go through but how much of an impact does this TBT does the, the success of TBT actually play within the NBA because you know the NBA is really trying to get started back with regular season games to the playoffs and, and they have to do this bubble for like at least three months so you're doing a bubble for three months TBT just did this for at least one month max and it became successful how much of an impact does TBT have when it comes to the NBA, maybe looking at what the, what precautions and procedures they may have taken within the bubble. Yeah, I mean, you you hit on a lot of great points and a, and a lot of things that everyone is wondering right now. What what TBT showed us, I think, is that if you get guys in a bubble and get them committed to staying in that bubble, this can work. All right, you know, so there were. Like, if you look at the testing numbers for COVID-19 as it related to TBT teams, they had everybody test at home before they got on site. And about 7 to 8% of those tests came back positive. So, you, you know, you lost a lot of people through that, relatively speaking. Then once you got people on site, there was a smaller number, but still a, a noticeable number of guys who tested positive even once they had landed or arrived in the bubble. But once you got through that initial wave of positive tests and you kept everybody locked in and, and secluded, COVID-19 wasn't a problem anymore. I mean, there were, after the first weekend, there were no more positive tests and everything worked pretty smoothly. So what you just said, though, TBT, those guys were in a bubble for two weeks. We're asking NBA players to be in a bubble potentially for three months. Now, in the NBA, in the case of the NBA, that, that field is going to get smaller, I mean, relatively quickly. You know, there's only this, there's this obviously eight-game regular season period. And then once that starts, you're going to have a bunch of teams return, leave the bubble, never to come back. And you're going to have the playoff field. And then the playoff field is going to get smaller consistently as this goes on. So that's one reason that maybe gives me some cause to, for hope here that the NBA can pull this off because you're really going to be asking two teams to commit to the bubble for that full three-month duration. And the two teams that make it to the finals are obviously going to have a lot of incentive to – to stay there and to obey the protocol because they want the championship and everything that comes with it. But there are more people involved for the NBA bubble than there, than there are for TVT. So, you know, it's, I think it's encouraging that TVT worked as well as it did, but it's a much smaller scale, both in terms of people and time lapsed than we're talking about for the NBA. So the NBA has got its own unique set of challenges. Absolutely. 
but we're all taking this one step at a time. And, and I think the fact that you saw it work at least on all level, any level has got to make you cautiously optimistic that at least there's a template that the NBA can to, uh, to make this work. Well, I hope, I, I hope they make it work. And I, me too. I, I, I really do. Cause even TBT brought back so much joy. I'm, so I mean, much I was, joy. I, I miss the sports. I miss NBA and I wanted to make it work, but I mean, you got people, positive uh, superstars over here already testing positive for COVID. Russell Westbrook tested positive for COVID. No, nope. Nikola Jokic tested positive before he got there. James Harden just got to the bubble because of family issues. Zion Lip Williamson just left the bubble for family issues. And then you got people like Dwight Howard getting pissed off because people are already using the snitch line. Like, I mean, <laughs> at this point, it's so chaotic with the bubble. I don't know what to expect. But with what you're telling me, I am slightly a little, just slightly more optimistic because of the fact that obviously it's starting big, so it'll be more chaotic, but as the season dwindles down, it could be more controllable like it was with the TBT to where hey, that could be a little bit eliminated. Yes, yes. I, and I think, yeah, again, you know, okay so, okay, so you're seeing guys right now like like Russell Westbrook test positive and okay, like that's that's a bummer, yes, but let them get it now, quarantine for 14 days, get it out of their system, and, and then be ready to go. And they really won't have missed that much time. I think what really concerns me, though, is that snitch line. Because, I mean, if you got to worry about somebody ratting you out, I mean, that's, that is going to cause your commitment to the bubble, to this process, to, to maybe crack a little bit. And that, that's one thing that TBT had going for it as well. That's easy to overlook. These guys were committed to the quarantine lifestyle. And I mean, look, like as much as we're saying that these guys in TBT are, you know, on the cusp maybe of NBA style of play, they still live a different life than NBA players, man. And, and they're not quite as accustomed to maybe the chartered plane rides and the five star hotels. You know, it's probably going to be more of a culture shock for people at the NBA level to get used to the quarantine life than it was for TBT players. So, I mean, I'm not worried about a LeBron James, a Kawhi Leonard, a Giannis Antetokounmpo. I mean, those guys know they have a legitimate chance to win this thing. I think they're going to be committed. But can you get the buy-in from everybody else to not make this thing fall apart? That's, that's what we're going to have to just wait and see. And what is your opinion on the second bubble? Because it's, it's been reported that the NBA is trying to do it. I think it's stupid. It doesn't make sense, especially since they're not really fighting for the playoffs or a championship. They're really just fighting just to stay relevant and collect TV money, which I understand why. But from, from a player's perspective, to me, it doesn't make sense. What, what, what are your thoughts about that? I read your article on that when you talked about the second bubble, and I agree with you 100%. I mean, I, I don't think – it just makes a ton of sense. And I understand why the idea might be out there. And look, I, I, I applaud the NBA. I mean, they're trying to make everybody feel like they're a part of the reboot. And, and I mean, why not aim high for pulling something off like this? But I think when you step back and realize that, I mean, there's still liability and risk involved here just by starting the season again in any kind of capacity. And I think you're seeing this play out in college athletics as well, where a lot of universities are like, hey, man, I mean, I don't know if it's worth it, you know, testing guys' commitment to this kind of quarantine lifestyle, because if guys want to go out and leave the bubble and, and do their thing and, and party and have fun, well, okay, that's their individual right to do that. But I don't want to be – you know, I don't want my ass to be on the line, pardon my French, if you want to go out and get sick and, and then sue me for, you know, not taking care of me or whatever. So that's why I think, you know, at the NBA level, for the teams that don't have a shot at this anyway, it's just, it's just too much unnecessary risk. I mean, why put guys in a situation where they're going to be tempted to go out in Chicago, have fun, get sick? and then spread it to other people and then, you know, put, put their teams and the entire league in a, in a place of, you know, trying to 
compensate them in some way or, you know, set up a possible lawsuit or something like that. So I agree with you. I just, I just don't think the second bubble is, is really worth it right now. Everybody listening right now, you're listening to Big Ten Network, play-by-play broadcast of Chris Boster with the V. And transitioning to college athletes, like you just said, you know, the Big Ten, as one of the networks you are representing when you do the broadcasting, um, they just announced, at least from a football and from a fall sports perspective, that they're going to only do conference games. And recently a report just came out today that they're only going, they're actually going to fill this, uh, have fans come in at 20% capacity from a football perspective. Is that a smart move? Like, because I understand you want to be social distant and obviously you got to get as much money as you can from these, from fans, ticket sales and things of that sort. But is it really worth the risk? Your opinion? You know, who's to say? I mean, I, I think of it, I think of a similar phase where we were in, in Chicago when, when they decided to open the restaurants again, but only at, at 25% capacity or whatever it was. I mean, when you think about operating costs, it, it, like, can you stay afloat with only 25% capacity? I mean, it, it like financially, I'm just not sure that that makes a lot of sense. Like it, so for college football, if you've got 20% of your stadium full, are you really even going to make that much money that way? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I'm going to give those people the benefit of the doubt and, and say that they've looked at the situation and have determined that it is worth it in some level financially to, to set the bar at 20% or whatever level they want to. Um, you know, I know that from my perspective as a broadcaster, I've already been told that, hey, even if we have a college football season this year, you're, you're not going to the games. I mean, we'll, we're going to bring you to our studio and, and have you do the games off monitors remotely, similar to what I did for TVT. So I know that regardless of fans, there's still going to be, you know, a much more reduced number of people that are even allowed entry into the stadium. Um, so it's tough. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I reading some headlines from NFL teams as they start to line things up for their season. And a lot of teams have banned tailgating before games. And so if you throw those kind of road markers or, or barriers down, I should say, I don't think a lot of fans are really going to want to go. I mean, it's even, even before this pandemic, I mean, there's always been the tug of war between, well, do I want to go and freeze my butt off in a stadium or would I rather chill on a couple of beers and watch it with my buddies in front of a big screen. And so there, you had that battle going on before this. And, and now I think you're going to see a lot of fans just say, Hey man, like this just isn't worth it. I like how you brought up the media aspect of how they're going to play a role within the broadcast and especially with big 10 network and the announcement that the big 10 made, because that was going to be my next question. The fact that obviously from a broadcasting perspective, you're not going to be present at these stadiums or at these games. You're actually going to be doing it remotely and remotely from the, the studio that they provide. It's, it's going to be very interesting because now you wonder how does that set up correlate with the Big Ten compared to like you did with TBT? How much of a success is that going to be? I think obviously I think it will be perfectly fine, but it's different watching a TV screen and saying, oh, dang, there goes one of my guys on TV actually at the game covering it compared to me one on TV saying, oh, dang, he's stuck up at the studio. Like, you know, it gives a different feel. It's, it's, it's a totally different feel. And, I, like, I'll give TBT a lot of credit because I think there are some things that, you know, like, you know, so me and you, we've peeked behind the curtain and, and we, we know, like, what a, what a sports broadcast looks like behind the scenes or what it's like to cover a game as a working member of the media. But I think – for the average fan, I think that there are some steps that networks are going to take to sort of smooth over those differences and make it not quite so apparent that the broadcasters aren't on location. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that the audience can tune in on their television or on their tablet or whatever and still have the same kind of viewing experience, all things considered, as they would normally. But 
you know, speaking just from my perspective, it's different when you're in a studio and you're watching games on monitors and you can't like tap into the energy and the crowd and you know, what everything that's going on. I mean, your field of vision is completely dependent on whatever the cameras decide to show you. I mean, you essentially don't have a 360 degree field of vision. Like when you're at the court or in the press box and are able to see everything with your own eyes. So it, it's different and, and it's, it's an adjustment period. And I mean, I know that, that for reporters as well, it, it's getting tougher because they're not going to have the locker room access or the, the accessibility to, to players and coaches that they typically do. I mean, a lot of beat reporters such as yourself are getting information from teleconferences now instead of one-on-one -on -one interviews or even group press conferences. And it's just, it's just not quite the same. So we've got to figure out how to work in this environment. And, and I, you know, I think for me personally, having the experience of covering TBT gave me a great frame of reference as to how I'm going to approach my broadcast going forward. But I mean, I, I think I speak for everyone else when I say we all want this state to pass and to just return back to, you know, as close to the way things were before. And, and, you know, we're never going to completely get over COVID-19. We're always going to feel, I think, the effects of this in some way, even when we do have a vaccine. But, uh, you know, I, I think there, you know, we definitely want to get back to a, a, a at least a closer sense of, of normal than we have right now. Speaking nothing but facts there, man. Where can, <laughs> where can, what, what, what you got coming up next? Good question. Good question. I mean, it, like nothing is the short answer and, you know, not to sound like doom and gloom about it or anything like that, but, but for me with the big 10 network, you know, that's, that's college athletics. So that's what I really pay attention to for the better part of the year. And, you know, there, there's, not been a lot of good news, frankly, that's come out lately about the future of college athletics for the fall. And again, I mean, on an individual level, like, you know, University X can say, all right, we're going to get all of our athletes together and we're going to put them in a bubble and we're going to be able to control their environment and make sure that they don't get sick and that there's no transmission. And okay, that's cool. But then when you bring in the travel component, it just opens up an entire can of worms and, and, you know, how do you handle taking teams on the road and getting in and out of stadiums and, and trying to keep players from, from leaving their hotels or going out at night. And, and I, and again, this kind of touches on what I said before when we were talking about the second bubble in the NBA, but when you introduce those other risk factors that no matter how hard you try, you just can't control in an airtight way. I, I don't think that universities are going to want to incur that risk of their student athletes getting sick. And, and especially look, if, if colleges aren't having classes, you can't justify having student athletes out on the field, uh, you know, risking themselves in that way. So, um, you know, I, I'm hoping and praying that, that there's some kind of, of shortened season or delayed start that, that gets, that gets college athletics back up and running, you know, maybe, late September or October, uh, you know, I, I take, I guess, uh, solace, uh, solstice in the fact that we're still in the middle of July and this is such a fluid situation. I mean, the situation really changes week to week that maybe we'll get through this second wave and by the time late August, early September rolls around, numbers uh, will be declining again and, and we can say, okay, this seems to be trending in the right direction. Maybe we can find a, a system that works. But, you know, the NCAA president, Mark Emmert, when he comes out today and says the data is pointing in the wrong direction, I mean, he, he's right. And, uh, you know, so it's just – it's very much wait and see right now. But I, I will enjoy the opportunity as a fan to watch Major League Baseball and, and the NBA get up and running again. And, and I'm rooting as much for my profession, as much for my personal fandom, that those – experiments if you will work because I think if, if MLB can get through its season if the NBA can get its season back up and running again I think that will bolster the confidence to, of college athletics to maybe find something that will work for them 
Well, either way it goes, I'm going to be paying attention to all that stuff. I'm definitely going to be paying attention to you and the work that you do on TV because obviously you are one of the best. So I got to give much my, 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 my love and support to you as you're on TV doing, these, doing the play-by-play broadcasting that you do for these networks. Where can they follow you on social media? Please follow me on, on Twitter and Instagram at CJ Vosters. That's V as in Victor, O-S-T-E-R-S. So CJ Vosters. Yeah, give me a follow on, on Twitter and Instagram. You know, I certainly do my best when there are sporting events going on to, to create some content, kind of some behind the scenes stuff. You know, I posted a video during my week at TVT of what our broadcast setup looked like, socially distance proof and everything. So yeah, would would appreciate your follows and and uh you know I, I'm definitely I'll keep you posted on what I got going on on my end, my friend, and and certainly enjoy following you and and uh, you know cheering you on and doing all the good stuff that you put out there as well. Appreciate that, man. We definitely definitely gonna be tuning in to what you got going on. Keep me posted so I can support in any way that I possibly can. And everyone t- listening right now, you can follow me on social media at that guy Josh Hicks on Instagram and at jhicks042 on Twitter. We got a lot of good stuff coming our way. Both of us, as a matter of fact, do. And you, this is definitely some stuff you do not want to miss. Chris, my brother, I appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the Indescope podcast. We'll catch up and talk soon. Honor and a privilege, my man. Thank you so much for the invite. And yeah, we'll be in touch. Yes, sir. You, you stay safe out there. Thank you. You too, bro. Appreciate you. All right.